Okay. Uh, everybody can see the screen, I'm assuming. Yep. All right, perfect. All right, so uh, getting going for tonight, um, just we're going to real quickly do uh, like we did last week, just a, a what's the buzz if anybody's got something they want to comment on uh, relative to the process, any conversations you're having with, with anybody, any feedback you're hearing for one reason or another. I know that's difficult in today's world. Um, and then um, Rudy is here uh, from uh, the elementary school from Lambert uh, to uh, continue our uh, series of understanding what's going on in our schools. Uh, and then we're going to go to our collaboration for this week, um, kind of a love it, uh, love it or list it uh, exercise if you're familiar with the show. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to uh, that point. So uh, moving on. Uh, what is the buzz? Does anybody have anything that you are um, you're able to share with us as far as uh, things that you're hearing uh, about the schools, uh, maybe about this process, about uh, the the future of of school, especially in a in a post COVID uh, world? And everybody's muted, by the way, so you just got to remember to unmute when you uh, when you respond. Well, while you're thinking about that, um, I'll, I'll just I'll bring you up to speed. Uh, uh, a couple people have suggested that I have not uh, mentioned what my background is, um, so don't don't forget about the the little uh, thing that we've got going on the the competition there. But uh, the the very first week was Modern Family, uh, if you can recall back that far. Uh, I believe the second uh, meeting that we had was. Uh, the second time I did that was uh, Seinfeld. Uh, last week uh, was the Death Star uh, in honor of uh, Star Wars week. And so, um, so this week, I, I won't tell you what it is, but you can guess. Anyone have any, any comments on, on the process at this point? No? All right. I'm moving on then. We got plenty else to talk about tonight. So again, uh, meeting norms, I'm not going to go through all the process, but again, um, I just, again, want to point out, and you guys have been really great about it, but let's just make sure we try to hear everybody's voice in the process. And if you get into small groups later, you're not hearing from somebody or somebody is struggling, you know, reach out and, and let's figure out a way to make sure all those voices are heard in the rooms. Um, like I said, you guys have been doing a great job, but uh, uh, that's probably one of the most important things that we've got uh, here. And uh, I just also will add, because we've done this process with a, a lot of districts and we're actually actively doing it elsewhere. And um, uh, you, you have a, a great group. And, and so I don't need to talk about assuming positive intentions and all that type of thing. Nobody seems to be coming in with an alternate agenda. Um, so I really appreciate that. And, and uh, it really makes for a great process. So um, moving forward then, um, as I mentioned, um, Rudy is here to talk to us a little bit about Lambert and what they're doing over at the elementary level. Uh, and this will kind of wrap up our series that normally would be all folded into one meeting. Um, but this will be our uh, wrap up our series about the schools. And then um, I, pro I, I, I apologize, Dr. Ricky, I didn't mean to leave you out. I should have had you on here. Um, <laughs> But Dr. Ricky is also going to talk to us a little bit about the Hawk Center as well. So I, sorry about that. No, um, no problem. Anyway, I, I will, uh, I will stop sharing my screen. And uh, Rudy, I'll turn it over to you. And and feel free to share your screen and 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 hit her running. He's on mute. Muted. Yep. Oh, you're on mute. Still on mute. How about now? There you, go. you hear me now? There. Very good. Sorry about that. Well, good thing I wasn't into it too far. 
I appreciate the opportunity to talk about my school and to be a part of this process concerning uh, the future of our district. It's, it's exciting to think about what can happen. And so uh, with that, let's take a look at Lambert Elementary. Um, kind of put this in the context of our vision. And I know you've seen this before and, I, and so I don't wanna spend a lot of time with it, but at the same time, I don't wanna just glass over it too because our vision is very important to us. It's a thread that connects us throughout the district and, and creates focus for us. And so when we think about the, relation, the relationship part of the vision, we're talking about multiple individuals at all levels demonstrating respect, trust, integrity, while working independently towards our goals by supporting and teaching positive student behaviors. And we work this into our building plan every year by supporting and teaching appropriate social interactions. We just can't expect that our students know these things when they come to school. And so we take that responsibility very seriously. And then the third point here, by enhancing adult to adult connections and communications. And so in the context of positive relationships, some of the positive things happening at Lambert is the focus on SEL, that's uh, social emotional learning. Uh, this past year, we uh, put in place in the district a social worker who is overseeing our MTSS system. And that's our multiple, uh, multiple tier uh, student support system, uh, and that has been uh, a huge, uh, a huge uh, accomplishment for us, or a step forward, maybe it's a better way to say that for us this past year, because this uh, focus on social emotional learning, um, it's fine. The, the focus on social emotional learning has, has really required a full-time person to oversee that process, uh, to, to make our system, first of all, robust so that we have um, the process in place to meet those needs for our students. Uh, our PBS committee has, uh, has been added to our TLC structure, our teacher leadership compensation, which is something across the all districts in the state of Iowa to provide compensation uh, and opportunities for teachers to develop leadership skills and work in uh, leader in positions of leadership like instructional coaches and things like that and we're excited about that zones zones of regulation uh, is a an sel curriculum that we've put in place this past year to help our students exactly uh, actually a year and a half ago to help our students learn those important self-regulation skills to figure out okay when i'm feeling out of whack what can i do to help myself and at Lambert, we have been on a journey to become a trauma-sensitive school, but that begins first with learning, becoming a trauma-informed school, working to learn about um, how sometimes life uh, creates obstacles for our children and challenges, and we're learning how to help our students through those challenges and learning how it affects their ability to, um, to be engaged in academic activities while they're at school. Some other positives, we've added a Head Start classroom uh, at Lambert that will begin next year. Uh, they've moved in now and, and uh, we're excited about that along with the same reason we were excited many years ago when we started the preschool program at Lambert. We've, we feel strongly that uh, any time or any opportunity that we can get students in our building uh, earlier and sooner, uh, it, it benefits them in becoming more acclimated in the school where they're going to begin their academic futures, building those foundations of success for the rest of their lives. Uh, along with that, PK is now fully inclusive. And what's, what that means is, is that uh, our preschool students with individual education plans, our special education students are in all of our preschool programs. And that's just uh, the, the best program model that we have for students with special needs. And so we're excited about those things that we're doing for, for early childhood uh, at Lambert. But some areas of concern for us, and, and these are, again, probably nothing that you haven't heard and they're concerns that are shared in, in truly all of our buildings. Uh, poor noise control, poor air quality, 
poor temperature control. Just to be more specific to Lambert, 50% of our classrooms at Lambert have no air conditioning. And uh, that includes uh, our youngest students, our preschool program, our kindergarten, junior kindergarten classrooms, our first grade classrooms, and none of the specials uh, have air conditioning. Specials, I'm referring to art, music, uh, PE, library. Another uh, big area of concern for us is storage. Uh, it takes a lot of resources to teach our children. Uh, and we can't keep everything in the classroom. And then uh, finally noted here, meeting areas for both staff and volunteers. Another part of our district vision is the challenging academics. Educators use effective instructional practices to actively engage students in diverse learning opportunities that require critical thinking and problem solving in real world context. And we do this by deepening knowledge of instructional strategies, by intensifying active student engagement in rigorous and relevant content learning, and by strengthening systems of teachers to uh, to teacher support, including professional learning communities, PLCs, teacher leadership systems, and multi-tiered multi <laughs> systems of support. And some of the things that uh, we celebrate at Lambert is that we really have over the years uh, become a learner-centered environment. And uh, I don't know if that's a, a statement when you first hear it that kind of surprises you. And you might ask yourself, well, aren't all schools uh, a learner uh, or centered uh, or, excuse me, focusing on learners? And that's certainly true. But let me try to explain what we're talking about here. Being a learner centered environment is really about focusing on what the students are learning as opposed to focusing on what we're teaching. And there's a big difference in that. And we accomplish this uh, through our PLC work, our professional learning communities, through that format where we focus on learning as opposed to teaching. To try to illustrate that or say it in, an, in another way, um, it's not about me as a teacher going through my scope and sequence of a lesson or a unit or my curriculum and saying, well, I've taught it, we're done. But it's about focusing on what the students are learning and making instructional decisions based on what students have learned. So the idea would be if the students haven't learned it yet, then I'm not done teaching it yet. Just because I've taught it once doesn't mean I'm done if my students haven't learned it. But we dig down even deeper than that in looking at, okay, why haven't they learned it yet? Is it a matter of simply needing more time uh, or do we need to teach it in different ways? or overcome uh, particular barriers that might be preventing the student from mastering that material. One of those barriers might be trauma in their lives, going back to that idea of becoming a trauma-informed school. Also, our standard-based grading focuses on the journey towards mastery as opposed to, okay, here's the final grade. You got an A or you got a B. Our progress reports truly do focus on a journey towards mastery. And then our teacher leadership compensation program, the TLC program provides both growth and leadership opportunities uh, for all of our teachers. But some of the areas of concern or needs, uh, areas that need to grow, uh, crowded learning spaces, a lack of quality areas for students and staff to self-regulate. We're learning in this trauma-informed journey of ours. It's not just about helping our students to be able to self-regulate and take care of themselves, but we need to support our staff in the same way. And uh, when you think about a, a crowded lounge and, and things like that, uh, we really don't have uh, those quality areas for staff to be able to self-regulate. You're going to hear, uh, and, and I hope you've heard before, about calming corners in all of our rooms at Lambert. And uh, when Dr. Ricky shares a little bit, she's got some great pictures of some calming areas uh, in the Hawk Center as well. Another area of concern is the lack of quality areas uh, for volunteers and, and community-based programs to meet and work with our students. We have a lot of outside support that comes into our building that provide uh, amazing support and additional opportunities uh, for our students and support the teachers as well in so many ways. But the areas that we have for them to work basically uh, are crowded hallways, and you'll see some pictures of that. 
And then again, the overall quality of our learning spaces, when you consider the problems with uh, poor lighting, poor temperature control, poor air control, these all add up uh, to really diminish the quality significantly of our learning areas for our students. And then the final piece of our district vision is the 21st century uh, portion of that vision. Uh, students will acquire competencies necessary for 21st century living by developing skills in the areas of civic life, health, finance, technology, and career readiness. And we do this by creating learning experiences in a real world context and by developing and applying career readiness skills. And I'll have to be honest with you, it, at first this was a, a bit difficult for me to wrap my head around uh, in regards to uh, elementary students. Uh, and I can speak to that here, uh, how, how I've kind of landed on a place with that. One of the ways that we do that for elementary students is through cooperative learning, specifically Kagan Cooperative Learning. Uh, Kagan Cooperative Learning helps students to begin to develop those very important soft skills. And that's how I make the connection for our elementary students to those 21st century skills, those skills that they'll need uh, when they become those professionals and the leaders in our communities and the adults in the world that are making those decisions. Uh, when you read the research about these soft skills, these are the most common reasons people are fired from jobs. It's not because of lack of skill or ability, but it's often because of the lack of their ability to get along with their coworkers. And cooperative learning is a very dynamic way to teach those skills to, to our youngest students. Zones is also a way that we do that. Zones is helping to teach the self-regulation skills students need to feel connected and in control. As adults, it's quite easy for us most of the time to control our feelings and our emotions, but those are skills that we've learned over time, and Zones is, is a part of that curriculum, that social emotional learning that we provide for students to help them, again, develop those skills specifically uh, to self-regulation. Some areas of concern or areas where we need to growth include having the, the quality space for students to learn self-regulation. As I said, we have calming corners in, in all of our rooms and a calming corner is nothing more than a space where students can go and sit down and maybe have a fidget uh, to manipulate with their hands while they go through some, uh, it might be some breathing exercises or some, uh, some thinking processes to help them to refocus on uh, what's going on with their life, how they're feeling. The zones of regulations talks about, uh, I'm in the red zone or I'm in the yellow zone or I'm in the green zone. And, and the students learn the language that describes the zone that they're in. And they also learn the techniques then to recognize when they're in the yellow zone and, and what they can do before they get to the red zone, to get back to the green zone, the place where they can can be successful and, and participate in positive ways uh, with their classmates. And in a crowded classroom, um, just having a, a calming corner, although we found it very effective, uh, sometimes students need more privacy uh, to be able to exercise those self-regulation skills that they're learning through the zones curriculum. And again, too, as I mentioned before, having those quality spaces for students who need to uh, de-escalate um, you know, sometimes students um, in the struggle of, of managing life and the things that they're dealing with as young people, they express those frustrations through um, some very inappropriate behavior. And we need to have quality spaces uh, for students to be able to manage those things, not closets and not old locker rooms. Uh, you know, we've all seen those news stories where schools use spaces like that. And as we move into the future, we really need to realize how important these spaces are and to realize that they need to be quality spaces where students uh, can feel supported and exercise the tools that we're trying to teach them uh, when they reach these points of, of honestly being, being out of control. Now, what I'd like to do now is just to share with you a variety of pictures from Lambert uh, to help illustrate the concerns that I've already shared with you tonight. So we'll just run through some pictures here. This is a picture of a technology storeroom um, 
And this is, uh, you know, we, we throw a table in there and that's a space where volunteers can go and work with students. And it's not always volunteers. Sometimes it's AEA staff that need to find a place to do some assessments for students who might be uh, being considered for um, an individual education program. Uh, and yeah, it's as cramped as it looks in that, in that picture, but we grab every available space. Here's just an example, and you can see this throughout the building at Lambert, hallway space uh, used by, by volunteers. And here it is at a bathroom. And you can imagine how distracting it is when an entire third grade class comes down to use this restroom. It's, it's not private, it's not convenient, it's, it's noisy. Uh, and, and sometimes that, that area of the hallway is, is quite crowded. But again, it just uh, illustrates that we grab every space available uh, to be able to do things like this to serve our students. And this is just another look uh, close to what you were just looking at down the, another direction in the hallway up towards the middle school. And again, just more examples of uh, tables and chairs out in the hallway that are used by students for, for multiple reasons. Um, and I wanted to point out too that this is a fire code uh, concern. Um, the fire marshal, when they come through and do their inspections and they see this, um, they're telling us to move these chairs and tables quite often. The concern is, is that it restricts um, the ability of students to uh, quickly and efficiently uh, exit the building if there were indeed an emergency. Here's another space used to work. So, uh, you know, we try to get out of the hallway and not work out there in the hallway uh, as directed uh, by the fire marshal. And so we find spaces like this in our book room. Uh, and this book room, I have several pictures here, is, is very crowded. And again, can be a, a very busy place too, as teachers come in and get resources out of that room, uh, or they're coming in because uh, it's also the work room. It's where the, the copier is. Um, <laughs> This area in Lambert, if you're familiar with Lambert, this is the old stage area. And I, I think it's important for me to mention that too, because I want, what I want to say to you is, it's not like we haven't done anything to try to address our storage problem. Um, we gutted the stage. Uh, the stage was basically taken over for storage anyways. And uh, because of that, no longer were programs uh, being uh, performed on the stage there at Lambert. So we took down the old curtain, took out the wooden stage and remodeled this room and put the catwalk in there and really uh, made this a very efficient and effective area for, for storage. Uh, but as you can see, as you continue to look at other pictures here, it's, it's, a, it's a busy place. There's a lot of things in there. Uh, if you look right here in the bottom left corner, that's where the copy machine is because this room also serves as a teacher uh, work area. Quite honestly, it's not, um, it's not the teacher's first choice when it comes to finding a place where they need to work. Uh, in this corner of the workroom, this is the area, the storage area for the backpack program. This is a program that we take part through the, uh, the food bank to provide food to needy, needy families uh, over the weekend. And uh, again, as I said too, this is where you'll find uh, the copy machine. So it can be a busy place with volunteers uh, working the backpack program, volunteers working with students, teachers coming in and binding material or copying material, or as you can see here, gathering material for their, uh, for a, a new bulletin board in their office and those kinds of things. If you ever wondered what a 50 year old bathroom looks like, um, don't uh, wonder anymore because this is what it looks like. And I realize this is a small picture, but as you look closer at it, uh, you know, the insulation's peeling off those pipes. We have exposed pipes. Uh, the structures there in the room are, are rusting. Uh, and quite honestly, uh, it doesn't smell that good. That, that tile in there um, is, is porous and it, it's, it's difficult and challenging uh, to keep clean and pleasant. Outside that restroom there, this is the hand washing area. And though, again, those are, to the best of my knowledge, 50 year old sinks that require a, a lot of attention. And this is located right there in the commons area. So many of you would be familiar with that if you've been in Lambert. 
Um, this isn't a 50-year-old bathroom, but it's an old bathroom. It's a bathroom we were looking at before when we first looked at that work area in the hallway. Uh, this is in that part of the building that as middle school and Lambert grew together, this is one of the newer sections, if you will, of the building. And I apologize, I can't tell you when that uh, was built, but I, I know UNESCO probably can. Uh, but even though it's not 50 years old, if you take a little closer look at the sink here, uh, this material is uh, deteriorating. Um, and going back here, this panel uh, frequently falls off and, uh, you know, they're old and outdated. I mean, it's, it's just that simple. Uh, this is a common sink, uh, classroom sink at Lambert. Uh, all of the classrooms in Lambert have a sink. And in the oldest portions of the building, this is what the sinks uh, look like. And uh, this is a closer look at the drinking fountain. I'll be honest with you, uh, students and staff don't use those uh, drinking fountains. In fact, they tend not to use the water in the classrooms at all for drinking, uh, just for uh, possibly washing hands or rinsing things out and, and those kinds of things. And if you were to, to uh, go up to a drinking fountain like that, uh, when you're looking for a drink, you might make the decision not to use it as well. And here's just another example of an old sink and the, the deposits on it and the, the wearing away of, of the finish. And, and uh, you know, this is pretty common throughout, throughout Lambert. We're excited and, in, in, uh, well, I shouldn't say excited. This is a classroom toilet in a kindergarten room. What we're excited about is we appreciate having a, a bathroom in the kindergarten classroom. Uh, with students that young, uh, it's, just an, it's just a necessity. Uh, when when a, a little guy's got to go to the bathroom, uh, he can take care of that and we don't have to worry about young students going down the hallway and things like that. But again, uh, this picture just illustrates, if you just look at the corrosion on the structure here and the, the problems with the wall and the tile here, this is a pretty common uh, look to our kindergarten bathrooms at Lambert. Most rooms with carpet look like this in rooms without AC. And remember, 50% of our rooms at Lambert do not have AC. Uh, and so, uh, especially when the humidity is high in the building, which is, is pretty common, uh, these uh, puckers, for lack of a better term, uh, swell up even more. And you can ask Dr. Ricky about how many times she's tripped on those when she comes into these rooms. Here's an example of using all available space for storage. This room will become the new kindergarten class that we've added. So where do I put everything? Um, a lot of the material in here, a lot of the tables and things will be used in this new kindergarten classroom, but most of it, by far most of it, needs to come out. And you really can't see it, but these are rather large shelving units here with preschool material. And so the answer to that question, where am I gonna move this? I'll get to that in a little bit. Here's another area that you probably wouldn't see just walking through uh, Lambert. In fact, a lot of this that I've showed you today, you probably wouldn't see on a casual walk through Lambert. But this is our changing room for students in diapers. And it's the old locker room uh, at Lambert. Uh, just off the PE room. We do have a very nice uh, changing table in there, but as you can see, uh, again, it's just we're always looking for places to store things and uh, every space uh, is used. This is just another view in that same room, just showing you the things that are, are cluttered in there. Um, draw your attention to this. This is the old shower in that locker room. And I finally had installed a door here because custodians uh, store chemicals in there like floor wax and stripper and things like that. Um, this is, uh, you know, the way things get stored. Uh, one of my teachers is the uh, district golf coach. And so she stores some of, of her uh, golf team equipment in here. This is equipment that she would use on rainy days and set it up in the gym. And again, where do you store this stuff? Well, here's an example. Here's an example of that. And I will let you know, this door is always kept locked. We just cracked it open here so you can see that. Um, and this is the meeting room. This is our, our meeting room that we use for IEP meetings, SST, BLT. IEP stands for those individual education 
uh, programs, plans for students, special education, SST, our student support uh, team, and our BLT, our building leadership team. Uh, but this room also doubles uh, as a, a storage area as well. And this is just a view from the other side of the room. Um, because of the variety of meetings held in this room, we often have a lot of visitors in this room. And unfortunately, that's not, uh, not the best impression uh, for the public to see, but often it, it, it's exactly uh, what they see. Now, in answering that question earlier, when we were in that uh, crowded uh, storage room that will become a kindergarten room, this meeting room is where I will move a lot of that stuff. Why? Because I have no place else to put it. Now, for a look at the Hawk Center. So, uh, Dr. Ricky, if you'd unmute your mic, I will advance your slides as you indicate. Okay, that sounds great. Um, I'll just take a couple of minutes because um, a lot of people don't know what the Hawk Center is, but when, when you've heard the other principals talking about the vision and the goals, those are the same for the students at the Hawk Center because they're first and foremost West Delaware students. And so we have the same goals for them as for all the other students, but I wanted you to get a look at it. So um, this is, I'm going to show you in a, a few minutes here a slide that you can tell where it is, but it sits right between if you walk from our football field over to Lambert, you would have to walk through the Hawk Center. A lot of people didn't know this wasn't our building until 2015. It belonged to St. Paul's, St. Mary's. And a lot of people thought it was ours because it's right in the middle of our campus, but it wasn't. So we had a need for um, a behavior focused program. And so we bought that building in 2015 for $150,000. And it has served us very well, but of course it has some needs as well. So Rudy, I'll have you um, move forward. Um, again, what you need to know about Hawk Center is that building serves two populations of students. The first is the high school alternative education program. Before we bought the Hawk Center, we rented a, a space in the church basement, one of the churches in town for our alternative education program. Uh, that worked sort of all right. Um, they didn't have great internet service there, so it was really hard to connect with other things happening in the district. Um, hard for the teacher to connect, but also for the students for learning opportunities. It also created some problems when we had a, a gentleman in town who really questioned our connection with um, religion and public schools, and so we had to make sure that even though we were using a church, there weren't religious icons visible to students. And so it, it just was very problematic. So we appreciate the church allowing us to do that, but we really needed to find another space. So I'll tell you in a minute more about what that alternative program is about, but that's for high school students. That Hawk Center has two doors on either end of the building. So the high school students come in at one end, they go straight to their classroom and the elementary students in the Bridges program come in the other end. So they very rarely interact, but the second program is a kindergarten through sixth grade program. We call it Bridges. Um, as I said a minute ago, both of these hold the same district vision and goals as the rest of the district because these students are part of the bigger district and they really deserve the same quality learning experiences and environment as the rest of the students, even though it's a much smaller population. So Rudy, you can go ahead. So this is a picture of the alternative program. You can see on the left, the goals there are really to reduce the dropout rate, to increase the number of academic credits that our students earn, to have a reduction in absences, to create a better connection to school, and to help students with some career and life experiences. So we have one teacher in that program, um, very skilled, qualified teacher. He actually has a PhD and has a special education background, but it's not for special education students. It's for students who um, are just struggling with the traditional high school setting. Sometimes that is because of attendance issues. Sometimes um, it's because of um, home and family issues that make it difficult for them to be successful. Um, and they end up falling behind in credits. And um, sometimes there are lots of, as I said, absences and so on. And so he, that teacher is there to assist them getting caught up in their credits, um, but they don't take all of their classes at this building, they just take um, one or two, depending on the student, and then they take most of their classes in the regular high school. And the goal is to get them back to West Delaware High School full time. But for some students, they need something a little bit different. So what the teacher also does is really helps them with some goal setting. They go on um, college visits, um, they go on some job visits and so on. 
to try to help them to understand that graduating from high school is what you need to do and to prevent them from dropping out. That has been very successful. We have, um, we serve many students there who um, are potential dropouts and they need something different. We also serve students who um, will come back after they've dropped out. So in Iowa, students can remain in school until they're 21. And so we have had students on more than one occasion come back when they're 19 or even 20 to finish up their credits. And so this helps them to do that. So you can see the, the teacher desk is kind of in the back there. And there are just small spaces all the way through because students um, work independently for the most part. So we don't have large spaces. We try to make it a kind of a comfortable homey setting and uh, less like a typical classroom. Rudy, if you could advance. Um, this is another picture of a different angle of that room. So it's one large classroom in the Hawk Center. Uh, the instruction there is self-paced. It's this online program called Edgenuity, where students can get all their credits. Uh, it's very difficult in an alternative program to have a teacher providing direct instruction because of teacher licensure issues. So if a student needs a science credit and the teacher happens to be a language arts teacher, they can't issue that credit. So we use an online program to get around some of those licensure issues and the teachers there to support the students. Um, as I said, it's for credit recovery for students who are behind in credits. We have licensed teacher. There's an additional focus on life and career goal setting and it supplements, it doesn't replace the high school experience. So sometimes people think if you go to the alternative program, you don't go to the high school at all. That's not true. It's for one or two courses and then we get you back to the high school. Most students will go to the high school for a part of their day. Then they'll either drive or walk over to the Hawk Center, um, take a class or two and, and go back and forth in that way. So that's how that serves our students. So that's one portion of the Hawk Center. This is a picture of Bridges and Bridges is completely different. They're completely different programs, which is why we actually use two separate ends of the building. We try to keep people um, in separate areas because Bridges is for students in grades K through six with significant behavior needs. Um, it serves West Delaware and surrounding districts. So we've served students in Maquoketa Valley, East Buchanan, um, Starmont. So even though it's a small program, uh, our district is large compared to those other districts and they're not able to have programming for students with those significant needs. So we serve some of their students on a tuition in basis. Um, we currently serve seven students with five adults. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the level of need of those students that they, uh, you might think, my goodness, that's a lot of adults for five or for seven students. Uh, yes, it is. And we need every single one of them. I serve as a principal of that building and occasionally I'll get called over there because they need additional assistance. So we're talking about students with very significant needs that need um, almost a one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, our goal is to enable students to gain the social, emotional, and behavioral skills to help them return to a traditional environment. So the location of the building is really helpful because it, the students can, um, we call it integration, when they're ready to return to a regular classroom environment, we can do that on a, um, a, a small basis. So we can have the students for the majority of their day at Bridges at Hawk Center and they might walk with an adult. That's why we need extra adults too because the adult will walk with them over to Lambert or Middle School and stay with them while they're in a class. So maybe we'll have a student who just goes to Lambert for art class and then they'll come back to Bridges for the rest of their day. And as that is successful, maybe they'll join Lambert for um, PE. And if that's successful, then they, you know, maybe we'll add math. And so we gradually add courses. We also have six, up to sixth grade students. So sometimes they go to the middle school, of course. Um, also, all of our students have um, music and they have art and they have PE. Um, the uh, art is generally integrated. Sometimes we have a community volunteer who does that. Um, PE is always over at Lambert, but we have our, one of our um, PE teachers in the district, Jeff Voss, teaches physical education to those students um, in their own classroom setting. Um, and then we, um, we also have music. We have one of our middle school music teachers comes over and provides music education to those students. So it's a little bit challenging because there are students in every grade level. Um, and so the teachers need to have curriculum appropriate to each of those grade levels. And also all of the students, uh, I guess I can't say all the students, the majority of the students also have special learning needs. So they may not be learning at their grade level in every subject area. So it's pretty complicated for those with two teachers and three um, paraprofessionals. So it's 
pretty complicated for those folks to do that, but they serve all the students' needs. You see it in that picture, students need um, quite a bit of unique uh, options to help them manage themselves in a regular classroom. So uh, Rudy's pointing right now. Thank you, Rudy. That's a special um, seat. It kind of wobbles and it's, it's squishy and it requires you to um, balance, which uh, there's a lot of research that just these small little adjustments help keep your focus. Um, Rudy, if you point to the bottom where underneath that chair, that's a thing that you can put your feet on and bounce your feet up and down. Um, behind there, you see that's another chair, that green ball. It's a, it's a chair on wheels, but it's a ball. Um, so the students, again, can move and it helps manage some of their um, active energy. Um, the desks that you see are unique desks because um, you can push that bar there and move the desk to any height. So you can stand up if you need to or choose to be that way. So it gives a lot of options for students to help them manage themselves in a regular classroom because sitting in a typical desk is, just does not work for them. Um, thank you, Rudy. If you wanna go ahead. This is a, another picture of the classroom at Bridges. So you see there's a little divider in the middle. The two, there are two teachers and they each have half of this um, space. Each space is a regular classroom size, but we usually have it open because the teachers, um, they teach students pretty much individually in, um, we call them stations and they'll go to five different stations because they have such varying needs that they really can't be in a large group instruction, except they do large group instruction for social skills. Um, every morning. So it's a, as you can see on the bullet points, it's very highly structured, very individualized classroom. That's why we need so many adults. We also need that many adults because the behaviors are very significant and um, very physical oftentimes. Um, we have very low student to staff ratio with small group and individual support provided for every student, specially designed instruction and behavior and social skills. It's tailored to individual student needs. Every student in this program has an individual education plan, as Rudy was discussing. Um, we have lots of community partnerships to support individual needs. So we have lots of volunteers who come in to work with our students. Um, we have Therapy Dog that comes in. We have uh, Families Inc, which is a counseling service, comes in and provides five hours a week of counseling, individual counseling to our students. Um, because of some of the um, trauma in their backgrounds um, that has created these um, enormous behavior needs. So lots of community support and partnerships. Um, I already said we have individual, um, well, these are behavior intervention plans as part of their IEP. Every single student has a very specific behavior plan and a response plan. So we know what they need and how we can help them and keep them safe as well as the adults safe. Um, we use the implementation of district-wide PBIS, Rudy talked about that, which is positive behavior intervention and supports. And our whole philosophy is um, a trauma-centered approach, as Rudy talked about at Lambert. We use that approach for the entire district, but it's especially important in a program like Bridges that has students with very, very extreme behavior needs and very extreme trauma in their backgrounds. And um, we need to take a trauma-informed approach rather than a um, punitive punishment kind of approach for that behavior. We're trying to teach them how to manage their emotions and their um, behaviors and how to um, move past uh, whatever's caused those behaviors. Uh, so that's a typical classroom. You see that table set up so students can work together if that's possible. Um, oftentimes it's not, but we try uh, because that's one of those um, job skills that Rudy talked about. In the back, it says take five on that table. That's a five minute timeout students can go to if they're able to stay in the classroom for instruction, um, but they just can't be um, with the rest of the group or at their individual station. They go back there and there's some calming items in that desk. Uh, Rudy, can go ahead. These are just to show you again what the classroom spaces look like. One of the most important things for us when we were designing this program is we don't want students to feel like they're in a holding room for the bad kids. This is their home. This is their classroom. They deserve to have a classroom like everybody else has. They don't deserve to feel like we're the bad kids. And so that's why we have these classroom spaces that look very much like every other elementary classroom that you'll see. And they have lots of books and lots of instructional materials. And um, the focus is on providing supports emotionally as well as academically and making the students feel like this is their home. This is their classroom and they want to be here. 
And we've been very successful at that. Go ahead, Rudy. Um, these are a couple more spaces, but these show a little bit more some of the specialized spaces they have there. So you see that, um, that uh, kind of bullet zone or target on the left that says we're on target. Those are the zones of regulation that Rudy talked about and there's students' names in the middle. So they determine whether they're in the green zone, which means I'm ready to learn and I'm regulated and I'm doing well. Yellow zone is, mm, I'm not really at the right place right now. Um, there's another zone too, but we tend to use these three. Yellow is kind of, I might be in a good mood, but overly excited and I can't settle down. Or I might be getting really upset and I need to take a break. And red zone is really, I'm out of control and I need some help to get back in. So the students learn to regulate and learn where they are. On the right, you see that's a learning space at that table. You see that red circle. That's as soon as the students sit down with their individual teacher, for their one-on-one -on -one session, they have to identify what zone they're in again um, at that moment. You see in the back, there's a tent so that they could go into that tent to get some private space and that's a calming area for them and reduce stimulation around them. You see there's a, a hammock swing chair. There's some research that talks about um, vestibular movements and how swinging helps kids calm. So that's a space they could choose to use. Uh, Rudy, go ahead. These are a couple of other specialized spaces. This hopscotch you see is on the floor. It's actually quite long. I don't think I have another picture of it. It goes all the way down the hallway. It's to help students um, move and jump and do different things as they're coming into the room so they can get themselves regulated, burn up some of that energy so they're ready to sit down and focus. Transitions are difficult for them. So we try to create some physical transitions. On the left is a space we call our sensory room. The squares are on the floor to again, use some movement type of things. Every day the teachers move in different sensory items for the students. And so they're like, we have a mini trampoline that they can jump on. We have um, um, some marble things where they have to put together things that move the marbles in a certain path. We have um, uh, fidgets and things they can squeeze and move. It's all to help them with some of that physical need that they have that helps them to regulate. Okay, Rudy. Um, these are a couple of other spaces. These are calming spaces. We have multiple spaces there. And remember, again, we only have seven students and that actually is the largest group of students we've ever had since we opened the program. So we often have more like four or five, but we need all of these spaces. The one on the left is called the Talk It Out Room. It's a place where if students are feeling upset, uh, they can go there. Um, if they're in that room, that's a signal to the teacher that I'm willing to talk to you and the teacher will help them process their emotions and think of better ways to handle it than getting um, aggressive. Um, in the right, it's called the hawk's nest. That's further back in the talk it out room. There are just those two big pillows there and that's all that's in that room. That's a place you can go if you don't want to talk to anybody. I'm very upset. I need to punch the pillows. I need to kick the wall, I need to scream and yell. That's a safe place for you to do that where no other students will be with you, nobody gets hurt. Um, it's trying to teach kids that there's a safe place to let that emotion out and it's not in the middle of a classroom setting. Okay, Rudy. Um, these are some more special spaces on the left. You see that's the talk it out room visible from the hallway. Um, there are some things that just to be honest with you, we have to do differently at Bridges and at Hawk Center. So for example, that glass needs to be shatterproof glass. Um, we have that of course in all our buildings, but we have to have it um, uh, especially reinforced because sometimes our students get pretty physical. And so we need to be very careful with glass doors and glass windows and things like that. Um, on the right, you see a, another uh, calming space. It's kind of on a swing and they can get inside of that and kind of cocoon. And that really helps them to calm in more appropriate ways than um, getting physical. Um, this is our kitchen on the left. The students all eat family style. That's part of the instruction actually. Uh, Lambert Kitchen brings food for them and they learn um, how to eat together, how to use their manners, how to ask for more appropriately. What do you do if you don't like a food? So that's all part of instruction. So instruction for those students starts the minute they get to school and they have breakfast and lunch together in this room. Um, and then on the right, you can see that's the, that's the back side of the building. And what you see facing you at the far end is Lambert. So you can kind of get a sense of where it sits if you don't know where it is and how close it is to Lambert. So the students walk to Lambert to use the playground, the gym, the library, 
um, or, you know, or they walk to the middle school depending on their ages. So, um, and I think that's the last slide I have. Yep. Awesome. Thank, thank you for that. I think, you know, one of the things that I noticed in going through those slides and particularly those last ones, uh, Kristen, that you were going through is, is the example of the furniture that's in there and the, the different types of furniture and the flexibility of it and, and what have you. We're seeing more and more of that start to show up in regular classrooms as well so that as kids are able to learn how to do regulation and be able to be who they are, um, you know, maybe you, um, you're able to, to get them to learn these behaviors earlier on before they become, you know, a bigger issue. So yeah. anyway, mm -hmm. um, uh, so at this point, um, we're, we're uh, running a little bit long night. I, I hope everybody noticed in the email that I had said we were going to run this meeting just a little bit longer because I knew we had the two presentations. And so I, I do want to get uh, to any questions or comments you have on this and then right into the Love It or List It piece. So first, um, I just want to open it up to, to any questions or comments uh, people have relative to both Rudy and Kristen's uh, uh, presentations there. And, and it was really nice to have some visuals this time, actually. Um, Dr. Ricky, I do have a question. Of the seven students that are in the bridges, um, I know you said it, we also service some of the other districts. Mm -hmm. do know how many of those are actually West Delaware students? Uh, yeah, and I'm trying to remember because they, they change periodically. So for example, they'll age out after sixth grade and whether they're ready or not, their own district needs to serve them. Um, so I think right now, if I recall, we have two from East Buchanan um, and I'm pretty sure the other five are West Delaware. Um, usually the majority is West Delaware, but we serve um, a couple from other districts. That's actually helpful because they pay tuition. And just to give you a sense of, um, we before we had bridges, we, we would send our students with that kind of significant need um, to other districts. And tuition is based on um, the total cost of the program divided by the number of students. And so it's pretty typical to pay about $30,000 for tuition. Our program is actually pretty cheap. Um, we. I think last year it was about $25,000. We charge those other districts. Um, but when we, we still have some high school students and other programs because we can't serve that high level, um, it easily costs 40 or $45,000 for one student to go to another district. So we actually get some money back that helps cover our costs. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else with questions or comments? Okay, well, I think we'll move to the uh, love it or list it uh, portion of this, and and then if you've got uh, some questions that come up or or comments uh, afterwards, uh, we can certainly address those as they come up. So uh, again, appreciate the uh, the conversations there. So I don't know how many of you guys have seen um, the TV show Love It or List It. It's on HGTV, uh, and basically the premise of the show is that. Um, you, you have a, a space in your house that is, is not necessarily functioning uh, the way you need it to now, right? Uh, probably did at one time, but because of changes, uh, uh, it, it just isn't functioning right. And so they go through a process, and, and part of the cuteness of the show is, is that you look at either staying in your home with remodeling or you go to a new, uh, or, or you go to a new home uh, that you might buy that, that is better suited for you. But regardless of, of that component of it, what, you're, what you need to do relative to this show is the homeowner has to kind of uh, identify uh, what those needs are that they need in their house, and they need to try to prioritize what those things are. Uh, and then there's obviously a budget that has to go along with that, uh, that you know provides oftentimes some limitations to those things that they're able to do. Um, and then undoubtedly uh, what happens in the show, which also happens in real life, is that you end up with some type of infrastructure uh, problem. You have a cracked foundation or you have a leaky basement or something like that that also needs to get fixed uh, in this process and takes away from the budget of, of trying to prioritize your, your needs prioritization. 
And so it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's a way to go through that process and understand the trials and tribulations that a lot of us have, um, and then also see uh, some cool houses at the end of the program. So uh, anyway, that, that's a, probably a, not the best advertisement for Love Air Listed, but nonetheless, it has some strong parallels to what we're trying to do here, right? We have schools that were designed and built a number of years ago. They functioned well back then. But we have some challenges with them today, right? And we have more challenges than we're probably able to afford to do. So what are the, that list of challenges? What's our budget limitation, you know? And then uh, what, uh, how, how do we go about trying to accomplish this, right? So uh, what I wanted to do is, is just use that as kind of a fun base to get into uh, small groups and, and create the list. They create a list on the show that says, you know, I need a kitchen, uh, an open concept kitchen and family room. I need a new master bathroom. I need an extra bedroom, you know, whatever. Uh, and so we want to list those things that we understand that we need relative to what happens in our schools from an educational standpoint, All right? We'll get that list put together and it's going to come back later in our process because after we go through the facility and infrastructure piece of this, we're going to do this again. And we're going to kind of get a list of things that we understand from that process. We're going to do it from the process of, um, you know, operations and operational costs and then financing. What it really helps us with is when we get to the end of the process, it helps us remember what was important about this part of the process um, uh, to us. And so, so we're going to get, uh, get into small groups. And what I, what I'd like you to do is, um, create uh, a list of what are the non-negotiable things based on what we know about what happens in school. What are those non-negotiable items that we need to have on that list that, that we need to update, change, add, what have you to, to, to our schools? And what are the items that we should have, but we might need or we might recognize a, a, a compromise based on uh, budget limitations or what have you? This is going to help us identify some of these priorities and some some potential components to recommendations as we go forward. So that's what we're looking for each of the groups. I've got you guys already assigned out into groups. Um, we lost one person through the presentation, so we've got uh, three and one, four and four, uh, similar to last week. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead, open the rooms, um, and we're going to go for uh, just uh, 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 Oops, hang on a second here. Uh, we're going to go for uh, 10 minutes um, and, uh, and then come back and, and discuss. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll still get out of here and, uh, with uh, about an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes. All right. So um, I will open the rooms. Now, every, anybody got questions on that? I'll, I'll run through the rooms like I did last time just to see if you're having any issues. But I, I think you'll be able to do it again what we want to do is just have a, a scribe, you know, or a, a note taker so that you can get me the notes like you've done in the past as well. All right. So here we go. Uh, so, all right. So hopefully, hopefully that was a pleasant experience. Um, I know it probably was not as much time as you wanted to spend necessarily, but uh, I thought that uh, we would take uh, the last, uh, a little bit of time that we've got here to uh, just uh, report out each of, of the of the rooms uh, what what you kind of had on your list and uh, as we uh, get past the first one if there's some stuff that's the same um, maybe skip that and just give us the uh, things that are different on your list than what you've already heard said so um, we'll start with uh, group three in reverse order that was uh, Dan and John and Lori and Tom I believe um, whoever was uh, kind of the recorder there, maybe can let us know what uh, you had on your list. Sure. Um, the, the priorities that we had listed were obviously to fix any of the known code violations or uh, if the fire marshal's coming through and giving recommendations on um, where people should and shouldn't be, putting a priority on, on those issues would definitely be towards the top of our list. Uh, we talked about the HVAC systems and um, question that came up there. I mean, obviously for it being a priority, uh, you need to ask yourself, is this something that can be easily retrofitted into the current building infrastructure or is it something that's going to require a good degree of shoring? Are we going to look at pads outside the building, rooftop systems, things like that. That obviously has a huge uh, 
determination on budgeting. Um, some should haves, uh, we should have right size, right fit storage. Uh, the question was asked if we could look into having some sort of a mobile unit system for the school. If there's overflow storage um, and it's a longer term prognosis for whatever it is, is this a semester long storage item? Is it gonna be stored for a year or two? Can we get some mobile storage units somewhere? The school has plenty of land um, is mobile storage an option? Uh, I had started talking and typing down meeting spaces with some privacy that would be on a list of should have items. And then uh, in the pie in the sky category or the, the dreaming category, we talked about other buildings uh, that may already be in existence that you could continue to acquire and use for uh, some of the tech programs. Uh, some of the some of the programs that are essentially creating a higher risk learning environment for the rest of the school, like if it's a, a detriment to air quality or uh, noise pollution to the rest of the school, can you move some of that stuff off campus and, and create another location for that? And then we also wondered, uh, since this is a, a love it or list it exercise, are there any other schools that you know of, Tom, that are for sale? And are going to be showing those to us? Right, right, yeah. Uh, in your in in your district, right? Because it's always about the location, right? You always got to be right. close to downtown. <laughs> location, location, location. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, Deb. Um, all right. So moving to group two, uh, which was uh, Caitlin, Josh, and Ryan. Um, what can you tell us about what you talked about that might be different, at least? Yeah. Um... So some things that weren't covered, we talked about um, as far as like the lighting um, for obviously the aesthetics, but also like maybe energy efficiency. Um, definitely the privacy in the office and the counseling areas that was talked about with the high school. Um, the middle school shower definitely needs to be addressed. Um, number of bathrooms and update the existing bathrooms, uh, more space for volunteers and such to get them out of the hallways. Uh, the safety measures um, that was talked about a little bit, adding the extra cameras um, and things. And then our would be nice category, we talked about maybe updated playground at the elementary, um, better pickup drop off flow um, at the elementary is a huge safety concern as well. And um, of course, just a more updated facility, better, better looking. It, the aesthetics. Yes, correct. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, great. Look. As you were talking, I could just see the show rolling in my head because some of the <laughs> same exact things that you'd want in your house uh, are, are what we want to hear. Um, I've seen so, the show a time or two. So, <laughs> yeah. so you're ready to sign up. Um, yes. All right. So uh, breakout room one was John and Marla. And, and thank you to Steve who switched over into that room uh, shortly after. So uh, what did you guys have? Well, this is Marla. I don't know that we picked anybody to talk. So I'll okay. just see what I can remember at this point. Um, that hasn't been said. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about, um, I think everything that we talked about as far as top priority has already been said, safety stuff, you know, the infrastructure, all that type of thing. Um, we just thought, really thought um, in some, when they're talking about storage stuff, that it just seems like things just sometimes need to be better organized. If there's just a way that, you know, and I've, I've watched the shows too, and there's just so many different ways to to reorganize things and wondering if how much of that is versus just needing more space. So that was one thing we really talked about, but I really liked the idea of the mobile storage someone had. That was pretty cool. That was a good idea. Yeah. I think other, everyone, I think everything else was pretty much mentioned from what I recall. Similar. Okay. Um, any, anything, any, any reaction from anyone about that list that you want to just maybe add to or, or put a punctuation mark on? Um, I just, I want to give you guys as a, as a whole group just to react if, if there's uh, something you want to react to there. Well, I think probably the biggest thing is I, from our group and the group that I was in prior, um, safety, I think is truly number one for everybody's thoughts and concerns on that. Um, 
do is there a budget at all target for any of this or is that at a later meeting um i'd love to know what a whole new entire k through 12 grade campus would cost um if you got a dollar figure on that let us know what our budget dollars are right and just to answer that question real quickly, we will get to uh, talking about uh, dollars and cents and financing options. And so we'll be able to take a look at what some of the costs are and some of the things that you guys are, are exploring. Um, and we'll also then be able to show you what kind of tax impact is associated with that if it happens to be a referendum for a property tax or how that works for some of the other financing options that are out there like Pebble and Save and, and those types of things. And so we'll, we'll, we will have a whole night on uh, uh, you know, going through the detail of that. But really what we wanna do is, is really flesh out those ideas with, without that constraint of cost at this point, understanding that we are gonna to have to come back and, and look at that though. Um, and uh, so uh, other comments that people have or uh, punctuations you wanna put? No, I mean, I think, granted, it'd be nice to have like all the things, um, but of course, I think the main things are for the safety and comfort. Those are just the neat things that need to be addressed first. And then, yeah, we'll have to figure out budget-wise over that what realistically we can do with the buildings. Right, and, and, and I know it's been, I'll say arduous, that's maybe an extreme, but tough to go through the last few meetings and, and hear about the academics and understand where this is going. But as we look at these ideas, and I'm just, I'm gonna share my screen while I'm talking just so we can finish fairly quickly. Um, and it's got my contact information on it again so that you guys can, can send your notes. But the next, next week I've got listed on here as well, is we start talking about the infrastructure and building systems component of this and looking at you know, what are some of those infrastructure issues? What are those building system issues that we've got? What does that mean and how does that play in? And, and, and the purpose for having gone through the stuff that we've gone through the last several weeks, which in a normal sense would have happened all pretty much at one meeting, um, we, we, we wanna be able to provide that context. So as we're talking about these infrastructure things and uh, we're talking about costs down the road that to Caitlin's point, we are able what is dovetailing with that programming that we're trying to do? How does it promote student achievement? Um, and I'm seeing a little sign that my internet was uh, unstable there. So I apologize if I broke up on you guys in that process, but um, any, any last comments or, or questions uh, on this stuff? Uh, like I said, next week we'll start on the infrastructure and building systems. We'll have one of our engineers from SiteLogic here to talk about the assessments that were done on your buildings there. Um, and then ideally we will move into doing some tours uh, very shortly here. Um, but um, I don't, I don't know, I, I don't know what we're going to be allowed to do. So some of that might be virtual uh, uh, initially, and then maybe we can pick up in-person tours a little bit later. Um, we're, we're going to try to flush that out over the next week here, and uh, we'll give you some more information on that. So uh, I appreciate you hanging in there tonight. Um, and um, we'll probably end up going a little bit longer next week as well, just because there's a fair amount of information to take a look at there with our engineer. Um, and uh, want to make sure you get a, a good, uh, a good understanding of, of those uh, assessments. So, any anyone with last comments or parting comments? All right, I, I will I will show you our last slide. Trying to get kids from the left to the right, um, and then of course our meeting again is is uh, next week Wednesday. So. Um, We'll shoot an email to you yet uh, this week. Uh, and uh, with that, have, have a great night, everyone. Um, can I just say really quickly, yeah. I want to thank everybody. I know this process is not what you had signed up for. And we're all meeting virtually and it's more time, maybe not more time totally, but each week. We really, really appreciate you being part of this. We need your voice and we'll get that. We just need you to understand the context before we get to that point. But I just want to say it means a lot to us that you're committing this much time. Thank you so much. All right, thanks everyone.